All right, I think we're ready to go now. Um, it sounds like the feedback is gone, so that's good. We're not going to kill everybody's ears. Welcome to this second Breeze webinar for 2018. Uh, in our, um, uh, our land of having control over everybody, we have muted you all and turned off your videos just so that we can ensure we've got the greatest bandwidth, not at all because we're into social engineering. Um, we uh, got a nice big packed program today. We want to encourage um, questions and discussion and ask you to do that through the chat function. So we're going to let the presenters run through their present presentations and I'm going to be taking notes of the, um, the issues raised in the chat as, as it goes through and then we'll have a good lot of Q&A or discussion time at the end and we'll ask, uh, I'll be able to put the questions to each of the presenters and they can respond in turn. So uh, we'll kick straight off um, and I'll introduce Professor Greg Dorr from the Kirby Institute who's going to give us an update on estimates and projections for viral hepatitis. Thanks very much, Carla. I'm um, going to run through a bit of an overview of where things are up to in Australia in terms of uh, hepatitis C treatment. Uh, uptake and outcomes and then move into some recent modelling work that we've done looking at what are the treatment scenarios we need to achieve to reach uh, elimination by 2030. Um, just to remind everyone in terms of the WHO elimination targets, uh, two of the key targets being a 65% reduction in liver-related mortality and an 80% reduction in hepatitis C. Incidents. There is some confusion. Some people use the 90% mark, but that's a combination of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So, in fact, the target for hepatitis C incidence reduction is 80%. Uh, as we all know, there's been an amazing uh, response in terms of the treatment uptake since the advent of direct acting antiviral agents uh, that became PBS listed in March 2016. 32 plus thousand patients treated in 2016 and about 21 and a half thousand patients treated in 2017 adding in several thousand patients treated through compassion access and other uh, avenues prior to PBS listing gives us around about 60,000 patients treated in all through DA therapy equivalent to just over a quarter of the estimated population living with hepatitis C. Has been a decline, however, not unexpected, given that we had very large so-called warehouses in large liver and hepatitis clinics. Um, so the decline you can see through 2016, and then leveled out between 2017 at around about 1,500 to 2,000 patients being initiated per month uh, during that period. There has, however, been a further decline um, in the early months of 2018. So you can see 2017, around 21,000 patients treated. Based on the first few months of 2018 and some very preliminary data from the, the subsequent three months, it looks like we're tracking somewhere between 15 and 17,000 patients uh, treated in 2018. So there's no doubt that things have declined from 2016. There may be a further decline in 2018. Uh, so just keep those numbers in mind when I present some of the modelling that we've done, looking at uh, projections of what numbers of treatment would require to achieve elimination. In terms of the jurisdictional breakdown, in fact, there's been relatively uniform uptake across the, at least the three major jurisdictions uh, in terms of total burden, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, who've all treated around about a quarter, a bit more of the estimated population living with chronic hepatitis C, a little bit of variability, uh, Northern Territory and to, to some extent, uh, Western Australia being a little bit behind those jurisdictions and ACT being a little bit higher, um, but pretty uniform really across, uh, across Australia. Um, you can see here in the next figure, the declines in the three major jurisdictions in terms of burden. Um, and again, pretty similar patterns. So, all these jurisdictions seeing declining numbers of initiations uh, per month through 2017 into the early part of 2018. Um, I think everyone's aware of the relatively broad prescriber base that we have in Australia. So this gives you the number of initiations by the major prescriber types. Um, and if we look at that by proportion of initiations, the increasing proportion of general practitioners and other physicians uh, is clearly evident. Uh, a lot of people ask who, 
who are the other physicians. In fact, they're a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, some are hospital-based uh, residents and registrars. Some are in primary care and community clinics under uh, the supervision of uh, general practitioners and other physicians. Um, so we're not completely sure what the breakdown would be uh, within that other physician group in terms of uh, the proportion treated uh, outside of the major sort of hospital uh, sites, but I imagine probably at least a half would be. So we're certainly getting to the point where a half of patients are treated by general practitioners and other sort of primary care or community-based clinic settings. Um, if we look at the prescriber distribution by jurisdiction, uh, in fact, New South Wales is very similar to the overall national picture. Uh, there are some differences in some of the smaller jurisdictions. You look at uh, WA, for example, has a relatively lower proportion prescribed by gastroenterologists and a higher proportion by GPs and other physicians. Uh, similarly, in Northern Territory, uh, on the specialist front there, mainly infectious diseases specialists, in fact, prescribing VA therapy. Um, I think everyone's also aware that there's been additional regimens added to the PBS list. Uh, the first major pangenotypic regimen, Sophosphavivil Patisphere, was added in August last year. And you can see how that sort of taken over really almost all of the Sophosphavivir uh, Decladisphere and a lot of the Sophosphavivir Lodiposphere um, treatment. Um, due largely to its sort of pangenotypic sort of capacity, but also to its potency and sort of 12 week duration. I think uh, people are aware that glucaprevir and preventosphere, the pangenotypic regimen uh, from AbV was listed on the PBS today. So we have our second pangenotypic regimen. So it'll be really interesting to see uh, what shape the overall distribution of regimens takes uh, now that we have two major and genotypic uh, regimens in place. Uh, we're very encouraged that the treatment outcomes have been favourable, and this is data from our REIT-C uh, observational cohort where we have outcomes in more than 3,000 patients have been commenced on DA therapy across a variety of clinical service uh, settings. And you can see the universally high uh, cure rates across these settings are incredibly encouraging. Um, so now on to the modelling that we've been doing at the Kirby, uh, led by Richard Gray and Amy Kwan, um, and that's been funded by the Breeze Initiative. And we initially did some modelling in New South Wales. We also did national modelling. We've just revised our national models. And I'll uh, take you through that, but clearly you can look at this in terms of the overall picture uh, as having very much relevance for the New South Wales situation. So you see how we now know, obviously, the numbers of people initiated on therapy uh, pre-PBS listing, the 32,000 uh, uh, in 2016 and the around 21,500 in 2017. So we sort of locked those numbers in and then projected forward from that. So the very optimistic scenario would be that we were going to continue on the 2017 treatment uptake uh, intermediate, which I think is the feasible scenario where we predicted a 20% reduction in 2018 and a further 20% reduction. So down to around 70, 17,000 people treated in 2018, we're tracking just about along the, that scenario. And then a further reduction to just under 14,000 in 2019 and beyond. And then importantly, uh, estimated a, a further scenario, a pessimistic scenario where the, the numbers would continue to decline to under 8,000. So it's really interesting to look at that. In terms of treatment coverage, um, you can see the proportion of patients that will be treated over time um, and how we will reach the sort of 80% coverage under, under the intermediate scenario uh, prior to 2030. And then looking at the number of people estimated to be living with chronic hepatitis C equally, you see those reductions more rapid in the optimistic scenario uh, than the intermediate, than the pessimistic scenario. Um, so now look at the key targets in terms of WHO. So uh, you recall that it's an 80% reduction in the number of new infections occurring by 2030. And it's quite interesting that even under the pessimistic scenario, we should get pretty close to that 80% reduction by 2030. Now, importantly within these models, we've assumed that the uptake of therapy amongst so-called high-risk populations, people that are currently injecting, for example, is comparable to the low-risk population. So if there was a deviation from that scenario, that would clearly have an impact on the incidence reduction estimates. 
and now look at the uh, estimates of liver-related mortality reduction. And um, <clears throat> this is a little concerning in the sense that um, there's a sharp sort of reduction in liver-related mortality under all the scenarios because of the major treatment that we've had, particularly amongst advanced uh, liver disease patients over the first couple of years of the program. Um, but if we track along the pessimistic scenario, which hopefully you can see that, uh, that figure coming up on your screens, um, if we track along the pessimistic scenario where treatment falls to under 8,000, in fact, the liver-related deaths after initial decline uh, start to move up. Um, so that's very concerning. Um, even under the intermediate scenario, we just about get there by 2030, but, but no sooner than that. And the reason why this target, this 65% reduction is so difficult to meet is that under a sort of interferon-based treatment scenario, it was estimated that we would have doubled the number of people dying from liver-related death between 2015 and 2030. So to sort of get the curve to turn around is actually uh, a big undertaking. Um, so just to acknowledge a lot of people, obviously, Kirby and our collaborators that uh, have uh, contributed to this work. And just to reiterate, Richard Gray and Amy Kwan's role and Bayzad uh, Hajari in terms of the DA uptake numbers. So thanks very much. Thanks, Greg. Um, there was a question there from Paul Harvey about Max Hopwood's study of GPs prescribing DAAs. I think that study is uh, a little bit um, less relevant in this case, because this was at the, at the time when GPs were required to work very closely with gastroenterologists or hepatologists or infectious disease people to, to get that training up. So I think we'd need, we need a little bit more, if we're looking at, um, if the question was also, how can we encourage GPs to prescribe? I think it's a new landscape now and require um, a more detailed look at this particular situation. So we're gonna move on now to Tim Duck from the Ministry of Health, from the BBB and STI unit to report the Ministry's report card. So our, our fantastic team here are gonna turn me off and turn Tim on. Great. Can you hear me, Carla? Okay. Oh, oh I'm yeah. getting lots of yeses yeah. on the screen. I'm just not hearing anything. So I'll um I'll get underway. So uh, thank you for having me talk today. Um, from our perspective at the ministry, this has been a really important uh, piece of work and and research that's come from led by the Kirby, but uh, lots of partners have been involved. So. What I'm going to do today is just run through, I guess, uh, how the research and um, work of the Kirby has been used to then inform our response in regards to hep C prevention and ultimately elimination uh, in New South Wales. So I'll um, just go to the first slide. Oh, sorry, I don't control it. I just say next slide. Great. Um, okay, so I think probably best to look at the whole system first and then I'll um, go into a couple of slides around what does it look like in reality where we look at uh, real world treatment initiation data alongside uh, the estimates and projections provided by this study. So in regards to New South Wales, um, New South Wales Health has committed to eliminating Hep C um, in New South Wales by 2028. And that um, actual commitment uh, was very much informed on the work of the Kirby and in regards to what was feasible and how New South Wales was tracking and what our facilities and settings enable us to do. So um, that's where we landed. And um, the way we performance manage the system is completely based on the work of the of the paper and what would be required each year up until 2028 and I'll show you what that looks like shortly. So hepatitis C treatment is a system priority in New South Wales. Um, so what does that mean? That means that we can then prime the system across all the investments that we make whether it's within local health districts who now have KPI targets in their funding agreements to reach a certain number of um, people treated each financial year. Uh, any NGO contracts that we purchase, we can make hepatitis C treatment a high priority. We also provide funding and contracts to Aboriginal medical um, 
Aboriginal community controlled health services, um, as well as any other private contracts that we have. And we can really put up front um, certain KPIs around hepatitis C treatment to make sure that all the available resources we have in New South Wales is going towards the same cause. So in regards to the response, because it's the early days and looking at it from a public health response, uh, that we have a very strong commitment to equity. And that means that we are starting with a lot of our efforts around supporting and targeting people who inject drugs to support them into testing and diagnosis and through the treatment journey. Um, that is because that group is the most vulnerable group to infection um, as well as reinfection over time. So um, that's where the large amount of our effort um, is being placed at this stage. And that's across um, and multiple priority areas around alcohol and other drugs, needle syringe programs, AMSs, Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services and prisons. Um, and then general practice also with the new drugs also have an important role to really broaden the net um, in regards to having people diagnosed and supported through the treatment journey. And, and for those who can easily access general practice and go through that journey, then um, we'll, we've done a, a number of investments to support them through there. And then what we are doing is also providing, um, working with the Commonwealth to providing PBS data and providing it to our services quarterly to guide their efforts alongside the targets that are provided by the study. So that's setting the scene. We can then kind of move swiftly through the other slides. So um, just to the next slide. So when we look at this slide, it's a lot to digest at once, but this looks at um, the system as whole uh, with New South Wales up the top. So in the orange column, you can see that that's the PBS data that we um, received from the Commonwealth, and that actually captures the total number of initiations in New South Wales, so people starting Hep C treatment. And what you see in the green bar represents the remaining prevalence um, that is provided by um, the report that um, Professor Dorr just presented on. Um, and that then guides our efforts over time to 2028 around how we're tracking towards elimination. And then we've also been able to break down those projections by a local health district to then understand, I guess, the prevalence um, that resides in their district and then how they're tracking because we do need uh, increased and in sustained efforts across every district to then be able to achieve our elimination target at the end. So just to the next slide. So this shows the most recent quarter of data that we have um, from the PBS data and we provide it back to the districts. And um, we can then look at it in a, in a kind of more granular level of looking at by month for New South Wales. And the treatment that we received at the most recent quarter did have December in it, which we did see quite a significant drop off. So we do try and use the data in a, in a more sophisticated way to then tell the story back to the district. So um, often, within the December data um, for all our services, we do see that it can have a lower level of activity during the, the festival season. Um, so we are interpreting, interpreting the data as, as best as we can and then using it in a performance sense. Um, so that's just one example. So just to the next slide. So this is um, a great example of how we've been able to use this study and the projections um, that it provides. So we then break down by LHD and give them in specific targets that they need to reach as part of their funding agreements. Um, and this is looking at the first quarter of data against their annual target, which has been divided by four. So you can see that in the in the green bars above, that's their quarterly target. Um, so this, this was the first quarter, and it does reflect activity from um, about six, seven months ago now. So um, that's something we always take in consideration. So this, since this time, um, we have been in conversation with all the districts and through performance meetings and using this data um, to understand where their efforts are, uh, are placed and um, what they're doing to respond to the need. And um, we've seen across the board since this data point um, increased efforts and sustained efforts across um, all the districts. So we are um, waiting uh, with eager um, anticipation 
for the next round of data and, and particularly then the next two quarters to see how the districts then um, respond in regards to the initiation numbers against those targets. So just to the next slide. So this is another one, um, which if you haven't seen it before, can be tough to um, look at, but what it does show is in the green bar, uh, it shows the proportion of people who have been prescribed treatment by a general practitioner um, during last financial year. And then the orange bar represents the proportion, so not the number, but the proportion um, of people who have been prescribed by a general practitioner in the first uh, six, well, the, the last six months of 2017. So depending if you're looking at a financial year or not. So this is our way of understanding if we are actually getting increased access to treatment uh, in general practice. And the best way to um, look at that will be once we have two financial years to put together. Um, so at the moment, the orange bar is based on six months of um, initiation data. Okay. Next slide. So this is my second last slide, almost done. Um, so when we look at the justice health setting, um, so we are then able to break down whether someone's been initiated treatment within justice health. And justice health have really come to the table with high energy and are rolling out increased efforts to get uh, as many of their um, people in custody uh, tested, diagnosed, and then through treatment. So you can see that with the, um, uh, I guess, increased numbers, and we do know that they'll, um, what we expect that the numbers will continue to increase. Um, and you also see there that are quite a high uptake there in the lighter uh, maroon colour, um, and that represents average, the proportion of people um, who identify as Aboriginal who is treated. Uh, which we would expect within the custodial setting, but it's also good to see that it is represented in the data as well. So just to the next slide. So in summary, um, what we've, we've done, as you've seen, is that we um, are able to receive as, as real-time data as possible around people actually being treated, all people in New South Wales, um, and then use that alongside the data from this uh, report uh, that Professor Dorr presented on to then really monitor and track how we're doing. So um, what we can draw from the different data sources is that um, we can now say that New South Wales is making progress towards the target to, to achieve the elimination by 2028. Uh, access in general practice does continue to increase in New South Wales. Um, and then that there's an increased effort um, at a state and district level uh, to continue that, um, I guess, momentum and, and, and increase it as well. Um, and that we anticipate those increased efforts will uh, translate into increased treatment numbers into the coming quarters. And that's it from me. So thanks very much, Tim. We're going to move on now to um, Brad Forsman, Director of Public Health in the PM Blue Mountain. And uh, just as we flip the technology over, we'll get uh, Brad set up to, to uh, drive his screen or we will drive it from this end. Yes, okay, great. terrific. Away you go, Brad. Yeah, thanks a lot, Carla. Um, thanks for asking me to present. Um, I'm just going to uh, give a pretty broad overview of what LHDs are doing um, in response to the, uh, the hepatitis C um, and the availability of DAAs. Um, and as Tim said, there are KPIs that we all need to, to meet. Um, and I, I got um, a lot of information, both from Tim, as well as the um, Directors of Public and Population Health, around the state um, to find out what we we're doing and and we will see um, a lot is actually being done um, and so hopefully as Tim said those numbers will increase um, with the numbers of people being um, being treated. Um, I am actually in Amsterdam at the moment um, so um, it's quite early in the morning <laughs> yeah um, and so I uh, please forgive me for my croaky voice. Um, I also just put lots of pictures of where I am currently so just to make you all jealous um, and Carla that's not Moving. Um, 
So um, I've, I've divided up, um, well, Tim, Tim divided this up for me um, into so sort of five broad uh, broad themes. So um, LHDs are doing strategic initiatives um, involving general practice as well, or more specifically, and then uh, things in the AOD and the NSP um, spaces, as well as some more um, sort of general community-based um, initiatives. Um, and so... Um, but before we go into that, um, I just wanted to um, represent, and the LHD is only just one part of, um, of the whole system, as we all know, um, and we do need to work really closely with primary care, um, as well as um, the NGOs, and all of that happens sort of in the, the broad um, sort of space as a community. And it's really important, I think, that um, the community um, who is affected by hepatitis C are involved um, in the response to hepatitis C uh, and to try to increase the, the numbers and the access, um, particularly in the marginalised communities um, that, that are affected. But you can see from this, I mean, LHDs do have a lot of, um, a lot, uh, a lot of spaces, sorry, a lot of services um, within it, um, which can be involved in, in responding to, to, LHD, uh, to hepatitis C. Um, and they include um, obviously the liver gastro clinics and, and the specialist physicians, but also a lot of the community-based um, services, which uh, as the warehousing, you know, the, the people that were housed with chronic hep C have all been treated, and um, the people who um, are less engaged with health services um, need to be uh, you know, brought in somehow and, and using those other public health, health promotion, um, the multicultural and Aboriginal health services and all the others you can see there, it's really important. Um, but we need to do that in a collaborative way um, with each other and also with NGOs and primary care. Uh, and so the strategic initiatives, um, so you can see here, um, I'm not going to read it out um, completely, but um, it's really important, I think, for LHDs to form implementation um, task forces. And then they can include people, um, clinicians are very important to be on there, but also um, representatives from um, sort of public and population health, as well as the um, alcohol and other drugs, uh, the needle and switch program um, uh, uh, units as well. Um, and those task forces could um, develop plans and policies or models of care um, for targeted settings in those um, other uh, services. So in NSP or AOD to try to get the, the more marginalized communities um, initiated on treatment. We also need to create community demand for treatment. Um, as I said before, it's really important for the community to be on board with this um, and that can um, be through uh, things that I've listed there. So peer-led engagement and um, the communication strategies are important as well through World Hepatitis Week events, um, and then using the specialist clinic triages as well. Um, we can use peer support models as well um, in priority settings um, as, uh, and partnering with the NGOs is very, very important. Um, obviously, uh, the training of staff is very important, um, not just in liver clinics, but also in these other areas, so drug and alcohol and NSPs, um, and using also research projects and, and funding through grants, um, like the New South Wales Health Triggs program, um, uh, to trial new models of care in new uh, with new approaches and in new settings. Um, there's a huge list of um, GP initiatives uh, which uh, I was told about by um, all the LHDs. Um, and if this will go ahead. Um, so, whoops. So, um, GP education and support. Um, we need to have new and more targeted approaches um, to GP and practice nurse training in that, um, which I think... Uh, as, as Michael Moore has been asking, who, who is doing the prescribing, what proportion? Um, if we can find out what GPs are interested in doing this um, or who are doing testing, then we can target those practices with education and training. Um, it does need to be a partnership approach, um, as I'm going to keep on saying throughout my presentation. Um, so primary health networks are very, very key um, to be in this to support and coordinate ongoing GP training. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, also, I mean, the LHD services um, need to be involved as well as community organisations to, to get that community engagement. Um, it's really important for, for um, us to be able to support GPs who are already working with priority populations, for example, the methadone prescribers, the, the OST prescribers. Um, this can be done through links with specialists or um, CNC outreach. Um, and for example, taking the fibrous scan into the dose GP practices if, if, uh, if that's required. Um, we can also um, create uh, GP support networks by inviting um, experienced GPs to partner with AODs and NSPs to provide treatment and then bring uh, to get the GPs to come to those services rather than try to get the community to go to the to general practice because often that isn't, uh, well, there's no, they don't feel like they're accessible. Um, we, we need to change the dialogue um, around hepatitis C treatment um, in, in general practice. Um, really important to emphasise um, that it is curable um, and also that it is a really, there's a positive impact of cure on both patients and prescribers. And it, we need to um, communicate those messages to um, GPs. Um, those local support networks um, we couldn't create also for new GP prescribers. So I'm um, getting experienced GPs to uh, support their local colleagues um, and uh, the local specialist services to um, keep on providing updates and education um, to, to keep the GPs up to date and engaged in the BHCV response. Um, Another um, thing that, that people are doing in, in, in my local health district and a couple of others, um, the public health units are doing active follow-up of new of hepatitis C notifications, so new notifications that we receive with GPs. Um, and it's similar, similar to the HIV support program, um, we're offering support from the liver clinic um, to those GPs um, with uh, how to initiate prescribing. Um, also with some outreach um, into the clinic, or, uh, sorry, into the GP clinic, or the GPs can come to the liver clinic and, and get some experience in um, how to do that. Um, we also are uh, giving them options for other education training, um, such as through ASHAM, um, Hepatitis, uh, oh, sorry, the Gast uh, College of the Gastroenterology Society, um, and a few others, um, and New South Wales Health and RSCGP, of course, are providing education too. Um, and then there are the initiatives um, in the alcohol and other drugs um, area. Um, it's important for LHDs to reorient the AOD services to be able to support treatment or pathways to treatment. Um, and so training the AOD prescribers to um, be able to prescribe Hep C treatment is, is important, of course, but also refocusing resources and setting targets, um, like local targets, to achieve elimination in that client group. Um, outreach clinics um, are very useful as well to, to go out to where the um, people are rather than expecting them to come into um, the hospital setting. Um, and the dry blood spot pilot project um, that New South Wales Health um, are running uh, is, is a really good idea, uh, or sorry, a good program to be able to get to these people. Um, and needle and syringe program, very similar to the AOD. Um, some NSPs um, are already um, providing hepatitis C treatment, um, such as Nupi and Blue Mountains. Um, the, also, NSP could um, coordinate access to other hep C services for the NSP clients and act as a sort of triage or a funnel to get them to other places. Um, or um, having actually having clinics in the NSPs um, and with peer support uh, is, is really important as well, particularly for those clients who are disengaged from our mainstream health services. Um, there are a few peer-driven incentive projects. Uh, so the Deadly Liver Mob um, is one of those and, and Positively Hep, um, and they, uh, they, they're quite successful in increasing uh, hep C treatment numbers. Um, and it's good for NSPs to be linked to clinical services for other um, blood and virus screening and care as well, because where there's hep B, there could be HIV and hep, that's where hep C, sorry, where there's hep C, there could be HIV and hep B as well. Um, and then finally, um, there are a few nurse-led initiatives that are going on, um, providing clinics in, in settings where homeless people um, are, um, with or without peer support, but with peer support would be, would be better. And also, as I mentioned earlier, making fibre scans and outreach nurses um, with fibre scans available in priority settings, so not just GP practices, but other places where the affected community is. Um, and so 
In conclusion, um, you know, LHDs are, are, are in a prime position to prevent and manage um, HCV, but in collaboration with, um, with each other within the LHD, but also with our external partners. Um, and the affected community, I think, must be involved in the development and implementation of, of programs. Um, I'm in Amsterdam for the AIDS conference, and uh, there, there was this, I was taken by this quote, um, which was about youth um, in the response to AIDS, but I think it's it's quite pertinent here. So, you know, nothing about us without us, and it rhymes, so that's, that's easy to remember. Um, and so that's it for me. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks, Brad. I think that was a very tricky way of putting in your holiday slash conference snaps in a presentation. And uh, Greg, <laughs> you want to know that um, although there are very lovely photos of, of around Amsterdam, we presume, the Netherlands is, a is one of the many countries in Europe where there is no GP prescribing, just saying. So um, we're going to keep going. And as I said, we'll come and have a, a fuller discussion at the end. So introducing now uh, for another LHD perspective, Steve Childs, who is the manager of the drug and alcohol and HIV and related programs for Central Coast LHD. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Carla. So we will go to the next, next slide. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So 25, so recapping, and so my focus will be a bit more of a narrow cast. So um, where I'm coming from is, you know, the challenge that we've been talking about today. 25% of the of all people have had the treatment and I think we're all feeling pleased that it's, things are going well. Um, their work has been guided by a, a range of by the ministry and by uh, a whole range of agencies organizations and I'll come back to this later but you know the the um, the hep C strategy in New South Wales is very important and you'll see why I'll come back to this when we're talking about drug and alcohol a little bit, a little bit later. The um, reason why I guess I was asked to talk today is that I think there's an, as we've been discussing, there's an increasing acknowledgement that we have to broaden our approach and bring in more services, more stakeholders, if we're actually going to get close to elimination. So where we've started, particularly with liver clinics and sexual health services and liver specialists, we're now looking at services like drug and alcohol to, to do more. So next slide. So, you know, we come to the challenge and the challenge is how do we encourage uh, clients in these other settings um, uh, to be informed about whether they are, you know, they are at risk the benefits have been tested again. The, uh, I couldn't agree more with the comments about we need to um, really market that message. Um, but also, how do we actually access uh, these clients into treatment? And, and if need be, also, how do we facilitate a referral, particularly for agencies that might be less familiar about how to do referrals um, uh, for, for Hep C? Um, in, in the LHD KPIs, there's a focus on uh, emergency departments, mental health, Aboriginal health and DNA. Obviously my focus is on drug, drug and alcohol, which is probably the, the one where we can uh, do more right at the moment, but that's definitely not excluding uh, work that can be done in those uh, other areas, but there's some, some um, real challenges in, in, in those areas as well. Next slide. Okay, so uh, one of the things I think which is um, a good starting point for us is that um, really um, my talking to my colleagues across the state for, for some years now in, with my drug, drug and alcohol hat on, um, I feel very confident in saying is that drug and alcohol services and uh, your senior clinicians across disciplines actually do see um, Hep C screening and treatment is hugely important. Um, 
And while there's always going to be a few people who are outliers or an individual team who might be an outlier on that, that's, that's a, there's a strong consensus there. So that's important for people outside of drug and alcohol to know that this has been something that the, um, the field has been discussing for years. And in fact, there's been a lot of training, um, taking the opportunity of workshops, conferences, and, and interdepartmental discussions. So we don't have a problem when we're focusing on drug and alcohol about hearts and minds. That battle's been won. The challenge is how do we actually do better? So we go to the next slide. Now, one of the challenges in drug and alcohol is that uh, across the state, there's a large range of service configurations between within LHDs and between LHDs. When I'm trying to explain this to my colleagues, say in a HARP, um, I can confuse them because drug and alcohol is not a monolithic uh, enterprise. Uh, there's different clinical streams governed by different clinical guidelines, and you've got a, a number of different professions. Um, and then each LHD is, is actually quite different depending on history and funding uh, as to how they actually operate. Um, we've also got differences uh, uh, with our addiction specialists. Um, um, many addiction specialists, you know, want to prescribe, are prescribing, but there's others who are still um, take the view that this, this might be something best done. Uh, by a liver clinic or, or by referral to a GP. So uh, across the state, there, there is not an absolute consensus on that, although I suspect the majority of addiction specialists now um, are certainly wanting, uh, certainly screening and certainly uh, wanting to prescribe. Next slide. Now, one of the things we've touched upon today very briefly is um, the importance of health promotion. And one of the challenges from a drug and alcohol point of view is that um, some um, LHDs have um, health promotion offices, uh, some do not. And in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat, um, somewhat balkanized um, system we have in terms of health promotion in the drug and alcohol space. So, one of the issues that we've got is if we are increasingly going to um, focus on people from groups that we're currently not seeing in great numbers, health promotion is one of your key levers for that. But um, how that actually works in a district or a region, it's not as simple as just going to one service or, or one team. Um, the other challenge that I just wanted to um, bring to your attention is that um, while the focus correctly, I think, is, is on uh, clients of um, ATP, um, in fact, uh, looking ahead, and this is certainly something that here on the Central Coast we've um, thought a lot about, is that we need to actually be mindful of picking up people who might have the infection, who will come through other doorways, one of the things we've certainly focused on, and I know other, other districts have, is using our detox unit. For instance, using detoxes as a way of doing screening, but also uh, be engaging counsellors and counselling teams. And I've given the example there of the person who comes in for treatment about alcohol, but because of ejecting drug use decades ago, in fact, they might have the infection. And we really need to be mindful that Drug and alcohol is not just OTP. Next slide. So perhaps the greatest challenge is always time. Um, drug and alcohol services don't just have uh, requirements under the KPIs for hep C, but um, guidelines, strategic plans for drug and alcohol, um, district requirements, all, um, all are pressures on drug and alcohol. So, when people talk about how do we re reorientate drug and alcohol services, it's not occurring in a, in a vacuum. And we're needing to actually reorientate in drug and alcohol on a, on a lot of things at the moment. Um, all of them good, but um, 
reorientating on hep C for drug and alcohol is in practice having to occur where we're reorientating on some other key issues as well. Um, I guess fit, fitting in with the data that Tim was showing us is that the biggest challenge which sort of overlays much of what we're talking about is that in some ways we've dealt with the easiest clients. Now we're having to really drill down how do we access and get into treatment more marginalised groups, including groups that we normally um, might, might not see. Or in drug and alcohol, often people will come for an assessment, um, come to detox, but then how do you retain people in treatment is one of the hardest things in drug and alcohol. And that's very important if we're talking about how do we engage and keep somebody in treatment, including how do we keep them in treatment for hep C. This is one of the key issues I think we're facing from the drug and alcohol perspective. Next slide. Okay, what will help? Um, just as we're talking about, it's always partnership and support, and it's always about communication um, and making sure that in terms of our response to hep C, it's not seen to belong to any one agency field um, part of health. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a shared responsibility. Um, other thing about what works is, um, I think it, it's useful to work from OTP upwards because OTP is the area of drug and alcohol which is most sensitized and has actually got a longer track record um, for the majority of clients in drug and alcohol settings. Next slide. Um, I've mentioned health promotion. Um, and the somewhat fractured space. Um, that means that in areas where drug and alcohol does not have a, or no longer has a strong health promotion um, resource themselves, then those at um, um, district or regional level um, need to really be mindful to work with a drug and alcohol service that might uh, not be as aware of the various health promotion strategies that we can use successfully. And then that goes the other way, of course, if drug and alcohol also has um, a resource. Next slide. Um, where, uh, my point here is, um, talking about health promotion is that, um, and this is something that again, on the Central Coast, I think we've, we've actually done a lot of work on, which is that for us health promotion, when it comes to hep C is working very closely with clinicians, our health promotion officers from um, drug and alcohol and sexual health, um, actually work very closely with cl clinicians. It's, it's and, and the clinician perspective has in turn informed how we do our health promotion. And I, I think that's been one of the wins that we've had so far. And when we come to doing, um, having workshops about hep, hep C, it's been both a um, health promotion as well as a clinician driven exercise. Next slide. Uh, engagement also always includes working with NGOs. Um, again, don't have any time to talk much about it today, but many of the NGOs in drug and alcohol, um, particularly the res rehab sector, have really taken on board um, the issue of um, assessment, screening and finding ways of treating. In quite a few res rehabs now across the state, um, the associated GP to a res rehab will actually initiate treatment for themselves um, or um, the res rehab will facilitate a referral, say, to a liver clinic and will help people be transported. Um, uh, great praise to NADA, the drug and alcohol peak body most of you know about. Um, again, they've been particularly proactive over the last few years and many of their conferences and their professional development work has been emphasising working with um, hep, hep C and mentioning to the work that NU is doing, which is just excellent. Um, and the peer link aspect of this is just so important. And hepatitis New South Wales that we're all feeding off and we'll continue to do so. Next slide. 
So final point on this is that um, I know we've been talking about targets. As somebody who has to meet targets, and uh, your, the figures you saw show that Central Coast had met its targets so far, but I'm not sure about that um, for the future, because I think uh, the challenge of how do we engage people that we know are carrying um, the virus or will uh, get the virus, um, I think this is a, a really stiff challenge. Uh, and I think this is a, a real mountain that we're about to climb for this next stage. So we're really going to have to not just be focused on targets, uh, but actually be mindful that it's, this is going to require a lot of cooperation across services. And that's probably it for me. Great, thanks very much, Steve. And we'll, we'll keep going for our final speaker, Michael Moore, who's the CEO of the Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. Over to you, Michael. Thanks very much. Um, is, is my microphone turned on? Um, okay, so I'm Michael Moore, the CEO of um, Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. Um, look, can I just say that there have been very good presentations and I think um, the main takeaway message from me from Stevens was that the, the patients that are easier to, to find have been found and we're now getting into the more difficult territory of finding the harder to reach patients. And I guess the take home message for me from um, Brad's um, presentation was that this really does have to be um, a partnership. And my comment earlier was that um, this is like a, um, uh, a classical collective impact operation where you have a backbone or organisation, which would be the local health district, surrounded by its partners, NGOs, the PHN, the GPs and so on, all helping them to achieve a common goal, all helping each other. OK, now back to my um, thing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so you guys might already know this, but in case some of you don't, Primary Health Networks, there's 31 across Australia. Um, we're tasked with increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of medical services, improving the coordination of care. And we do this by understanding um, the, uh, the needs locally through a, uh, a, an objective analysis, um, looking at um, what service gaps exist, providing support not only to GPs, but also to allied health practitioners. Um, we have specific funding um, to do commissioning and e-health. And actually, I'll give you a little bit more detail on that if you, if you go on to the next slide. So we get operation and flexible funding, innovation funding, mental health and drug and alcohol and Aboriginal health funding. The entire national program costs about a billion dollars a year. Of that billion dollars, $750 million goes into the commission project. So that's mental health, drug and alcohol, Aboriginal health, e-health. Uh, and these are generally fairly tightly um, uh, controlled uh, dispensations of Commonwealth money where there's not a huge amount of flexibility. But there are drug and alcohol programs that we commission. So we don't employ people, we contract with other organisations to provide them. And uh, again, going on from the comments from the previous speakers, if you're interacting with PHNs, that's certainly uh, uh, an avenue that's worth exploring because a lot of the drug and alcohol clients, of course, will um, uh, be at risk of hep, hep C. Um, now, in terms of um, getting onto the, um, the agenda, um, given that there's only $250 million across the entire nation every year that they have available for non-commissioning stuff, you're competing with a lot of other things. You're competing with, you know, diabetes, you're competing with cardiovascular disease, you're competing with a whole range of um, other things. That, um, and it's difficult to get onto the agenda. Um, so what I would say is that um, LHDs who are interested in engaging with their PHNs need to understand what the process is whereby these kind of allocative decisions are made. So there's a needs assessment done. So drug and alcohol um, services need to ensure that their, um, their voice is heard in the needs assessment, which get, gets done every year. They need to ensure that um, their message gets onto the clinical and community councils that all PHNs have. Um, and if you know the member organisations, so many of the primary health networks across Australia, their member organisations, the old divisions of general practice, so there's GP organisations. If you have connections with the old GP organisations, get them to agitate on your behalf get involved in stakeholder community engagement workshops. And um, the old uh, continuing professional development programs is a, is a really good way to make sure that you stay on the agenda for GPs. Um, we, when we did our needs assessment, we had good input, input from the um, 
drug and alcohol sector and the um, uh, sexual, sexy, um, sexual and bloodborne virus sector. And so we actually um, put some funding in to, um, to have a position dedicated to um, sexual health and bloodborne viruses. But uh, in New South Wales, I think we're unique in that. Um, so next slide, please. So the sort of sort of things that you want your local PHN to do is to recognise that viral hepatitis is a priority for the region. It, it clearly is for us in Central and Eastern Sydney. We fund a, a um, uh, we commission out a service with one of our local health districts called iChat. Um, Phoebe, could you just remind us what iChat stands for? Oh, so who it uh, stands for? I should know, but I've just forgotten on the who the most. Integrated Community Hepatitis Assessment and Treatment. iChat. So it's a really nice little program where we've funded a, um, a CNC um, to go around and visit practices and promote a whole range of behaviours that Brad actually ran through very nicely and some of which we took a note of and which we'll talk to them about because he had a really good list of stuff. We do newsletter mail outs. We've developed a clinical uh, with a number of clinical audit tools because uh, the thing to remember is that 80% of Australians will see a GP at least once every 12 months. And if you've had a diagnosis of hepatitis C, there will be a GP somewhere that has that note, uh, that that, um, that pathology uh, report. 80% um, of the GPs will probably have it electronically. Phoebe um, has developed a uh, an audit tool that can not only pick up all the people that, are, that definitely have a Hep C diagnosis in a practice, but also will pick up people that um, who may not have a Hep C diagnosis, but have a um, an LFT profile that is suggestive of. Um, uh, going into um, having further investigation to exclude it. So there's a number of things that you can do with GP data now. And um, that's one of the, the things that we're just only just starting to, to, to work on with our little live chat program. Uh, that'll probably do it for me. Um, I guess the only other things that I would just quickly say is that I think the LHD leadership is really important. Um, the other thing that um, is important in general practice is that uh, GPs get... Um, CPD points for clinical audit and there's a quality improvement practice incentive program coming up where practices will get um, incentives for doing data-driven improvement. Now that won't come into effect until 1 July 2019 but it would be very good for um, bloodborne virus drug and alcohol um, people to get in the ears of your local PHN and say this would be a really good um, clinical audit to encourage your GPs to do. Um, the other thing, and my last point, is um, health pathways. If your local primary, if you're doing a, a, a health pathway site with your local um, primary health network, you need to be sure that there's a Hep C pathway. You should audit it now and make sure that there is. Thanks very much. Great, thanks. What we're going to do now is unmute all of the presenters so they we don't have to, have to do the very clunky um, reply via chat, but uh, happy to um, receive questions from the rest of the group via the chat function. And there was a bit of a discussion earlier about what GPs who prescribe OST might do in other parts of their lives. And I, I think the issue was, can we uh, encourage them to prescribe OST, not or, sorry, Hep C treatments, not just in their OST work, but in their general GP work. Do any one of the uh, speakers want to tackle that issue? Uh, well, Mike, Michael Moore here. I, I think that's a really good idea. The other thing that you would want to encourage those GPs, who I would hope are already um, doing the prescribing, is you would use them as um, uh, as role models for other GPs um, and get them to encourage their, their peers to start pre prescribing as well. Nothing like a good testimonial to get GPs to move. So, Carla, just from the Ministry's point of view, um, just to quickly add, we always check in with each district around the range of activities that are going on and, of course, it varies across the state, but um, I mean, it is a key setting where um, people are, are providing hep C treatment, but obviously there would be a lot more opportunity to have more prescribing going on. Other issues from our uh, terrific audience that you want to raise? Mm -hmm. 
Michael, I think it was your comment there talking about collective impact with the LHD as the backbone. Do you yep. want to expand on that anymore? Well, collective impact is, is you know, one of these uh, American um, approaches, which is kind of common sense, really, um, but they wrote it down first, and so there you go. And it's, there's five parts to it. You've got to have a, um, an agenda that the partners within the collective um, uh, all agree on. You've got to have a, a measure that they all agree on, and, and the measure that we would have is what proportion of, you know, people with FC that we know are in our area have actually got into treatment. And that those little diagrams are really good for kind of focusing people. Uh, you need to um, have a backbone. Uh, so that's somebody that organises the meeting, keeps the data together, keeps everybody um, on task. You need to have um, really good communication between the, um, the the partners in the in the collective. And the, the last thing is, and probably the most important thing is, the, the members of the collective um, shouldn't be working in isolation from each other and just having a chat. They should be actively working to assist each other. So, you know, for example, some of those things that Brad Forsman was talking about in terms of, um, you know, the public health unit, uh, once a notification comes in, talking to the general practitioner of the person that was notified is the sort of thing, you know, where a, a public health unit can help the GP. So if we, if we work together and help each other, um, I think that's probably the, the big take home message from Collective Impact. Greg, you had a comment you wanted to make? I just wanted to clarify a little bit further in terms of the scenarios that we uh, used and uh, the, how the numbers would translate into the New South Wales situation. So in 2017, New South Wales treated, I think around 7,500 uh, people with DA therapy. Our scenarios uh, would have it that New South Wales should treat around about 6,000, hopefully uh, this year in 2018. And then the intermediate scenario translates to a bit under 5,000 being treated in New South Wales per year going forward. So just to provide a bit more sort of jurisdictional context um, for the modelling. Okay, and then we've got um, Catherine McQuillan talking about pets and audits in the GP setting as difficult because GPs think you might be overstepping the privacy boundary. Anybody want to comment on that? Um, I think the, the privacy question is, is an interesting one. Um, I think if a GP picks up that a patient is um, hep C positive, um, then there's nothing wrong with that GP uh, contacting the patient because it's their patient. Um, and if a um, public health unit contacts uh, a, a general practitioner because the patient is positive, um, I, I, I think that really, well, I, I don't know the Public Health Act that well. I certainly know that if somebody's HIV positive, then the public health unit is protected. I don't know about HC, actually. I'm guessing that they would be, but I don't know. So, Michael, it's Greg here. Just to follow on from that, I mean, we've been sort of thinking uh, at the Kirby whether there would be any capacity to utilise uh, hepatitis C notification registry, either those notifications held at the sort of LHD public health unit level or at the, uh, the state sort of level uh, to do a sort of a look back type sort of uh, initiative where you would go back to the diagnosing, notifying clinician, acknowledging that many people may have moved obviously. Um, but it seems to be enormous resource we potentially have to try and get more people sort of linked into care and treatment. But clearly there would be some issues around how that type of initiative was taken forward. So do you have any sort of views around that? Well, look, in terms, I, I can comment on, on HIV because um, our local health districts both have um, units that will contact the GP directly uh, and they're able to do that because of the Public Health Act. And it's actually really incredibly useful because half, about 50% of new HIV diagnoses are made by um, what they call HIV naive GPs. In other words, they don't have any patients that currently have that diagnosis. And so they usually um, welcome the call um, and the support that's offered. And I'm just thinking if you've got a, um, a register of patients, even if you can't, um, even if you can't, uh, disclose the patient's identity because you don't have that public health act protection. And I don't know, maybe you do, but I don't know. Um, you could certainly identify the GPs that have the highest concentration of those patients and contact them and say, okay, out of your thousand patients, 
um, you've got 20 patients that we know are Hep C positive. Can we send somebody around to help you treat them? That's that's not um, that's not going over any privacy um, areas, I don't think. So we we will come back to Jeff Bartlett's question in a moment, but um, Alison Nikitas is talking about the lookbacks work they did in um, in their LHD through the notification system for eighteen months and have continued to contact all GPs who have new notifications. So that's a, an example of a nice collaboration between the LHD, the GPs. Is that Southwestern? No, um, Murrumbidgee. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. That's right, isn't it, Alison? Yeah. You can yeah. chat through, yeah, and Tim knows, of course. Yeah, so, I mean, the I've been holding up, I thought Brad might jump in, but he may have fallen back asleep. Um, <laughs> thing is in Amsterdam. But, but um, you know, from what I understand is that we, we can use the notification data to follow up with, the, with the GP, because um, it's to do with sharing information for the for the you know for the care of that patient. So I don't know if Frank can provide any more clarity. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm not asleep. Um, <laughs> I was I was going to say, Jack, I was about to say what Alison has typed in um, that they they um, sent me through the information about what they have been doing and and um, I think one or it might be at, at Western or Far Western New South Wales. They're also doing a similar thing and. Um, have managed to make one town uh, with their drug and alcohol service Hep C free, um, and so in you know, Nepean Mountains also we we did look back for twelve months um, and contacted those GPs um, to offer their medication as as, um, as Michael was saying or, or Greg was saying. So um, I think it's it's very doable. Um, it's in LHDs that don't have a, a huge amount of notifications. Um, it's okay to do, but if we're looking at um, sort of the inner city, um, the LHDs where there are large, large numbers of notifications, it could be more of an impulse to the public health unit, but if the Kirby got involved then um, that might make it a bit easier. Um, I think you've startled Greg there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what are you signing him up for? <laughs> no, we're a funding agency. <laughs> <laughs> so should we go to, to Jeff Bartlett's question about remote consultation and is that a barrier to engaging GP? Look, um, is it, this is about the, um, the need to um, uh, get a, a specialist opinion before you start prescribing, isn't it? Um, Sydney Local Health District's got a, a fairly good way of um, doing that. I think most people have a four sheet now. Yeah, you can you can you can do it um, uh, by sending by fax. You can send something into a you know a secure fax line and then get the feedback from the unit, and then that um, that gives them the the clinical overview. You know, you can you can force the patient into uh, having a consultation if you want, but that seems to just looking at the two LHCs with their different approaches in our area, um, doing it by fax seems to be way more efficient. That's Greg here. We've also worked with ASHAM to set up an online mechanism by which GPs can go online, uh, fill out a form that we've developed, a one-page form uh, that gets sent through to one of the specialists uh, in the group and we guarantee a turnaround in 24 hours in terms of that uh, consultation. Yeah, well, see, I think that's, that's ideal and that's the sort of thing that should be being promoted everywhere. You know, you want to make it as easy as possible for the GPs to tick the boxes so they can, in safety, do the appropriate prescribing. So we've just hit our time um, and that there haven't been any further questions come through. So I think it's time to, oh, we've just got a bit more from Alison there. Um, saying that look back process seems to have promoted a lot of activity, activity with GPs. And um, can you send me the details for that and can it be used by GPs across New South Wales? Yes, from Greg. All right, so we can distribute that to our to the people on this webinar. Online. Yeah, yeah the yeah, online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the remote line on consult, you know, is, is a wonderful idea. And, you know, again, that should be promoted across all of New South Wales as well. We need to make it as easy as possible. Um, we, um, Phoebe and I just did a, a very quick epidemiological analysis, and it's probably wrong, but we worked out that if the proportion of prevalence across New South Wales is 0.5%, the average GP is going to have five patients. So none of them are going to be expert at this. In our area, they'll have 10. 
So even in our area, they're, they're not going to be experts. So the more support um, you can provide the GPs with, the better. Great. So I think it's time to, to um, switch off, but say thank you very much to all of our presenters, particularly for Brad for doing it tough from um, the other side of the world in a completely different time zone. Really appreciate that effort. Terrific. Thank you very much. And can, can we just say that Brad's slides were the best? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I um, agree. Thanks, thanks to our, our terrific um, uh, people out there in cyberspace by, for uh, contributing and participating. And thanks very much to our team here, Joanna and Darren, who've been doing all the technical support. So thanks very much. We'll sign out and this will be a recording available later on. Have a good thanks, afternoon. Thanks, Carla. Okay, thanks very much for organising it. Thanks, Carla. Thank you.